C25. Marking 25 years of the Legislative Council's committee system. In 1977, Labour Premier Neville Rann introduced a bill to reform the Legislative Council. The key reform was for members of the Council to be directly elected. The bill was put to a referendum in 1978, and it won the overwhelming support of voters. Before 1985, the Legislative Council operated largely on a part-time basis, often meeting for only a few hours each sitting day. The Council was sometimes criticised for not doing any real work as a House of Review. Well, I became a member of the Legislative Council in September 1979. It had been a part-time house. Um, it uh, commenced sitting at 4.30 in the afternoon, for example. There was, um, if at all, a very short question time. And of course, once you've got them elected, then you have to make them do some work. Mm -hmm. And that was when things started to, to change. But at the beginning, it really was um, uh, an old boys club. Mm -hmm. Unless it was made to be an effective institution, then it would be uh, almost impossible to resist the pressures to abolish it. Max Willis recalls a legislative council very different to that of today. There was a, a, a very gentlemanly approach to things then. I mean, even in the house, there were no ladies' rooms. The gentlemen's rooms were, had gentlemen on them, and the ones the women used were, just had private. The council during this period did have in its membership experts from various vocations as well as remembers. The members tended to be true experts, and I mean that in the sense of having vast experience in their particular field. For example, uh, from the country party, there was a, a fellow called Mac Faulkner. There was nothing that man did not know about the wool industry. Similarly, you had um, Sir Edward Warren, Mr. Cole, mm -hmm. the, the founder and the, and, and the maker of Cole and Allied. Nobody in Australia knew more about the coal industry than Sir Edward Warren. An opportunity for change came about with members becoming directly elected and paid full-time like their lower house counterparts. Members began to consider a new approach to the Council's work and procedures. Before 1988, select, joint select or joint standing committees were formed on occasion to look at topical issues. For example, there was a joint select committee on parks for mobile homes and caravans. The joint standing committee on road safety. But there was greater scope for the Legislative Council to operate as an active and effective House of Review. For instance, Lloyd Lang lobbied for the establishment of a system of standing committees. Its purpose was to try to restore some meaningful degree of parliamentary check on executive government of whatever persuasion. Lang believed there was a growing concern in the community that Parliament was not functioning as effectively as it should. Lang, in 1979 and 1980, moved to advance the matter by creating a select committee on standing committees. He was unsuccessful on both occasions. Despite Lang's advocacy, change was not forthcoming. It was not until 1985 that the Labour leader of the government in the upper house, Barry Unsworth, successfully moved that a select committee be appointed to inquire into and report upon the most appropriate system of standing committees of the Legislative Council. As Max Willis recalls, the Select Committee on Standing Committees worked to try and get a consensus with the Labor Party uh, on
on a blueprint for future standing committees which was acceptable to both sides of politics so that we could have a bipartisan approach to it. The members of the committee were Ron Dyer, Lloyd Lang, Delcia Kite, Toby McDermott, Kenneth Reed, and Max Willis. The committee reported in 1986 and made 30 recommendations, with the key recommendation being the establishment of four standing committees. However, the recommendations were not the new Labour Premier Barry Unsworth's top priorities. Ron Dyer recalls, Immediate aftermath of the report, I think the government's uh, response was um, somewhat um, muted and quiet. During the 88 election campaign, Liberal candidate Nick Greiner promised that if elected, he would establish the standing committee system recommended by the report. With the Greiner government coming to power, the standing committees on social issues and state development were soon established. According to John Hannaford, um, I still remember the discussion with uh, the then head of uh, Premier's department, uh, Jerry Gleeson, uh, about uh, the concern of uh, uh, allowing such committees to exist and the danger uh, that could arise from uh, allowing such to occur uh, and the cost that might arise as a result of it. And um, uh, the compromise was that there would be two committees and that they would be funded. Uh, and that's how that uh, we ended up with uh, uh, what is it, the uh, State Development Committee and the Social Issues Committee. The first reference to the Standing Committee on Social Issues was made by the Minister for Family and Community Services, Virginia Chadwick. It concerned adoption information reform. The inquiry received over 400 submissions and made 25 recommendations to reform access to adoption information. The chair of the adoption inquiry, Max Willis. And if anyone were to say to me, in your 28 and a half years in Parliament, what do you think is the most important thing you did? I would unquestionably put my finger on that standing committee. Similarly, the Standing Committee on State Development has worked on important issues of growth and industry, such as the adequacy of water storages and nanotechnology. Committees value their role in taking Parliament to the people. They are a vehicle for public consultation and debate. The positive contributions of the Standing Committees on Social Issues and State Development led to the Carr Labor Government establishing the Standing Committee on Law and Justice in 1995. Initially chaired by Brian Vaughan, this important committee has actively contributed to greater understanding and improvements in complex legal areas. The committee system, as we know it, was completed in May 1997 with the establishment of five general purpose standing committees. These committees focus on government accountability with noteworthy inquiries, including policing in Cabramatta and the Gentrader electricity transactions. It snowballed into one of the most controversial inquiries ever in the New South Wales Parliament. Late this afternoon, the final report and a blunt assessment of what went so wrong with policing in Cabramatta. The hike is not listening to the community and not listening to the frontline police officers. I think the management style has to be changed. As expected, the committee chairman said the people of Cabramatta were effectively abandoned by the police command. Their fears and complaints over gang violence and drugs were ignored. The power sell-off inquiry the Premier tried to stop has delivered the damning report she'd feared. The Upper House Committee has recommended whoever wins the state election tears up the contracts. It's the review the Premier did everything to avoid. Now it's obvious why. Once the facts uh, became public, uh, this would 
be very damaging. The committee slammed Christina Keneally for contradicting her own evidence about why she shut Parliament early. It found the move was to prevent scrutiny of the midnight power sell-off. Since 1988, Legislative Council committees have conducted over 300 inquiries, examining numerous issues of significance to the people of New South Wales. If you want to know more, please refer to the Legislative Council's C25 commemorative monograph, entitled, Keeping the Executive Honest, the Modern Legislative Council Committee System, 1988-2012.